Known of the murder sites by name in any case. Mitre Square, which I already spoke about, the murder scene of Catherine Eddowes. I'm afraid, as you can see, it's undergoing... I'll call it the Doctor Who of Jack the Ripper murder sites because it's undergoing its third regeneration since 1888. So you have to go back quite a long way to see the original stuff. This is what it was like back at the time of our story. And if you imagine that we're standing at the entrance to the square over there in that corner, we are standing there, all right? So that's where we are at the moment. You can see how dark and gloomy this little place was. All right, it was lit by one gas lamp, which was in that corner. It wasn't working properly on the night of the murder either, so hardly any light got into that corner over there, which is that corner where my finger is. And that corner, ever since, Sergio Philip, the 30th of September, 1888, has been known as Ripper's Corner. All right? And it's basically where we would have stood if it wasn't for them over there. <laughs> first come, first serve. That's the way it is. So anyway, yes, yeah, so they're quite well known. The only thing left really now is what you're standing on, the cobbles. If you're standing on them, get the vibe now. Because I don't think they're going to be here for much longer once the redevelopment goes. Change. It's one of the things we can't stop, I'm afraid. Now, I do have a photograph of Catherine Eddowes. It's not very nice at all. Um, it was taken in the mortuary, but she's still got the injuries to the face, the throat definitely, and the abdomen. It's not great quality, but it adds to the sort of grittiness of it. So I do warn you in advance as it goes round. Now, you've got to bear in mind, you know, we talked about the night of the double event with all the controversies and the clues. That could arguably have been the peak of the murders. It certainly terrified and shocked people, and they were all wondering what was going to happen next. So you can imagine the shock several weeks later, the biggest gap between the crimes, when Thomas Bowyer finds that horrifically mutilated body of Mary Jane Kelly, you know. They didn't see the photograph like you have, right? But they would have had all the lurid descriptions. So that really preyed on the Victorian imagination. It caused all sorts of people to comment because it was just so awful. Even Queen Victoria, the next day, sent a telegram to the government and she said, these are her words, the detective service is not what it should be. It must be improved. She was not amused, basically. Um, you know, thank you very much, Your Majesty. It's all very uh, helpful advice. Um, but one of the things that's quite interesting about the legacy of the Ripper is something that she also mentioned. She said, all our courts and alleyways must be lit and the slums must be torn down because they create crime and vice. Right? And she had a good point. She wasn't the only one who thought of it. This is one of the legacies of Jack the Ripper murders. They have, I've heard it said that Jack the Ripper did more to benefit the people of the East End than any politician, religious leader or philanthropist had done in the preceding 30 years. It's suggested that those horrific crimes focused everyone's attention on how bad the area was, right, and finally gave the authorities the required kick in the pants to basically get up and do something about it. And yeah, within a few years, some of those dodgy places had been well lit, alleyways had been widened, and that Flower and Dean Street area, which we started off at, gone all raised to the ground and replaced by more respectable dwellings. Um, Jack the Social Redeemer <laughs> goes around every now and then. Um, but obviously you've got to bear in mind that with Mary Kelly, they had no idea whether it was going to be the last one. So admittedly, there were a few ripper scares afterwards. None of those women were killed anywhere near as badly as the five we just talked about. So they don't sit very well, um, as far as experts are concerned, as being part of his canon, if you like. Um, so therefore a lot of people think, as I suggested earlier on, that it all ended shockingly with Mary Jane Kelly on the 9th of November. And it basically stopped and ended with the entire world scratching its head wondering who the hell was responsible for it all, you know. Now, I've got to say, you know, we talk about the legacy of the Ripper, the historical impact on it, and yes, lots of people study this in great detail in universities and schools, but the one thing that I think keeps more people coming back to this story than anything else is the mystery of who he was, all right? Who was Jack the Ripper? If they'd have caught him at the time, you know, it'd have all been over. This wouldn't be happening. None of this would be going on. So, you know, I'm sure you're aware there have been lots of theories as to who he was. I'm wondering if you know how many. So far, over 300 people have been named as Jack the Ripper. And I'm going to go through each one of them now with you. <laughs> of course not. It just shows you how fascinated people are, doesn't it? Now, it can't be all of them, all right? It can't, might be none of them. But some of those ideas are good. Some of those ideas are ridiculous. I, I challenge some of you not to giggle about them, right? Um, at the time, we're all looking at the archetypal outsider because it has to be someone who isn't like us. That didn't just mean foreigners. People with mental illness who might have got out of a lunatic asylum or something, they were considered outsiders. So, yeah, 
a lunatic escaping from asylum could be the culprit. Um, religious ideas that weren't like ours. Some people suggested it might be something to do with ritual sacrifice, or even that the killer was gripped by a religious mania and was cutting up prostitutes to kill them off and clean the streets of sin. I mean, that was quite a popular idea at the time. Someone mentioned, uh, oh, what about animals? You know, it's not even a human being, right? Some people suggested it might have been a lion or a bear that escaped from a zoo or something, albeit one with skill with a knife, you know, which makes it ridiculous. And yeah, the idea that a woman might have done it was actually brought up in 1888 in a letter to the Times, and that would have had the Victorians spitting out their gin and tonics, you know, <laughs> blimey. Today, we know that serial killers can be female, and they are pretty ghastly things they do as well. Um, but at the time, it would have seemed ridiculous. You know, you can, can't you ladies, do some pretty horrible things. Right? A midwife well, is really the most common it. idea put forward. Because a midwife would have had a reason to be with prostitutes for um, medical reasons, I suppose, gynecological reasons. Had the required medical knowledge at about the right places. And also, has a job is having blood stains on your clothing. Not only that, has the trust of another woman, all right? Women together, as it were. And, of course, the police were looking for a man, weren't they? So they'd dip under the radar. When you put it like that, it doesn't sound that ridiculous. And, in fact, that was a theory favoured by a very famous author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Hmm? Heard of him? Yeah. And if that theory, the Jill the Ripper theory, as I said earlier on, is good enough for the creator of Sherlock Holmes, the greatest detective of all time, fictional, um, then it must have something going for it, mustn't it? Having said that, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle also believed in fairies. <laughs> There was a lady on my tour yesterday who said, yeah, I do, they're real. It's strange, isn't it? So, yeah, let's forget about Arthur Conan Doyle, shall we? Um, some of the theories do... Oh, the police officers. What about the police officers who investigated all this in the first place? Believe it or not, some of them, a few years later, went on record and said they knew darn well who the Ripper was and that when it was found out who he was, they realised there was no real point telling everybody about who it was and that he was just put in an asylum or something like that or he died or what have you. Uh, this is where we get the well-known suspects Montague Druitt, George Chapman, Francis Tumblety and the mysterious Aaron Kosminski. Four important names because they, you know, they were accused of being the Ripper by some of the leading detectives in this case who would have known everything. Right? Um, they've all got reasons for killing. They've all got reasons for stopping, which is a good thing to have if you talk about the Ripper. And they weren't just plucked out of the air in the 1950s, all right? Still. So they're very important. The problem is, it's more than one name, isn't it? You know, we're looking for one name. And if the guys who would have known more about this story than anybody then or now cannot agree with each other, a bit frustrating, isn't it? You know, when you think about it. But that's why the doors have been left open, you know, for everyone else to have a go. Some of these theories do reflect the period in which they were made. For example, the late 1950s was the Cold War, wasn't it? So there was a couple of theories that came out about Russians being responsible. Right? It's all about fear of communism and things like that. That the Tsarist secret police sent a mad doctor over to butcher prostitutes, get away with it, and basically undermine the establishment and the integrity of the British police. A big Tsarist conspiracy, you know. Well, there you go. Um, the 1970s were riddled with conspiracy theories, like Watergate, Lord Lucan, who killed Kennedy, where some of that sort of stuff started to come out. So Jack the Ripper got his own one, right? And you might have heard about the idea that some people think this may have been done by a member of the British royal family. Anyone heard that one? <laughs> one of the most famous theories of them all. 1970 it first came out. Prince Albert Victor, the Duke of Clarence, Queen Victoria's grandson, was the original culprit. It didn't take him long to realise it could never have been him. Right? That doesn't matter. We love a good conspiracy. So three, day, three years later, 1973, Sir William Gull, Queen Victoria's physician, is put in the frame. And this is the most famous version of it. All right? um, he was apparently told to go off and murder prostitutes by the government because Mary Kelly and her four friends knew about a scandal that involved the prince, which, if it got out, basically would, would bring down the monarchy. They blackmail in the government. They want money. Otherwise, they're going to reveal all. You know? So Gull gets the job, butchering them all, and basically save the face of the British monarchy. Lovely story, utter lies, all right? None of it is true, even though the people in the story are real. It's all been disproven by, um, what do you call it, um, research and things like that. But has anyone seen the film From Hell? Yeah. With yeah. Johnny Depp. You mentioned it earlier on, didn't you? Uh, that's based on it, 100%. Michael Caine was in a little series many years ago. It's based on it too, all right? And there's been other versions of it. Lovely story. But it won't go away, even though it is fictional. Uh, there was a guy on my tour last year who was basically standing right there where you are, at this moment, shaking his head at me. How dare he? And he was going, nah, it's definitely the royal family. It's got to be. <laughs> I said, why is that? He said, well, you know what they're like. <laughs> that was his only reason for it. 
Um, other famous people like Lewis Carroll, <laughs> Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man, Vincent Van Gogh, William Gladstone, the former Prime Minister. They've all been named as Jack the Ripper. I mean, if you name a famous person as being the Ripper, it, your, your book sells more, you know, things like that. Uh, some ideas do get very far-fetched, all right? They do get quite conspiratorial. I know someone who, or a few people who claim that the answer lies in the letters and the writing on the wall. Why? Because they're all anagrams. And if you've got a few years of your life to waste, jumbling up all these letters, you'll find all the stuff there. Brilliant. Strange, isn't it? <laughs> or that if you look at the distances between the murders, they all correspond mathematically and stuff like that. It's getting very complicated, isn't it? What about the idea that it's to do with Satanism? Five murders. Join the murders up on a map. And it creates the pentacle, a five-pointed star. Well, it doesn't. It creates the five-pointed sausage. <laughs> but don't tell those people that because it ruins their fun. You know? <laughs> I mean, it is very easy to get overcomplicated. And to be honest with you, it might not actually be as complicated as that. One of the reasons serial killers get away with what they do for so long is because they don't stand out. They're not famous and they look like us. They can hold down jobs. They've got families and things like that. Um, I've known people, I've had people on my tours who've known serial killers back in the day before those individuals got caught. And they couldn't believe it when the truth came out. It helps them dip under the radar. It makes them scary as well. And if Jack the Ripper is an archetypal serial killer, maybe he was just some complete nobody. You know, I know one historian who says that at the end of, you know, the day of judgment, when all of us are supposed to stand up and answer for our deeds on earth, someone will say, well, Jack the Ripper, stand up and say his name. He goes and does it, and everyone's going to look at each other and go, Who's that? You know? Just a nobody. And if so that was quiet. the guy... Huh? He was so quiet. He was so quiet. That's what you get. <laughs> Lovely guy, really helpful, that kind of thing, you know. Um, and if that's the kind of guy that they were looking for in 1888, then we're still looking for that guy now. But we have an unfortunate gap of 128 years, missing evidence, dead witnesses, and the idea, of course, that no one will ever agree with each other. All getting in the way. So I think for that reason, and lots of others, this mystery will stay a mystery. Long after we've gone, I mean, you still might square up and pull it down as many times as you like. I still think we'll be none the wiser. It has legs, <coughs> to say that. And it will still keep attracting new theories every year. Um, books, of course, television documentaries. Look how popular Jack the Ripper tours are. I don't need to tell you that, do I? That's a phenomenon in its own right. But at the end of the day, never forget, it was actually a real story. You know, we do often forget that because of the media and all that kind of thing. And you've heard the story of five women who basically died horribly and no one deserved it. You know, not a lot of people came out of this story very well. Um, it's a true story and it's quite a tragic one at that. But we do forget it, especially maybe this time of year because of Halloween, because of the way the rip has been reinterpreted by the media over the years, you know. And uh, I can hold up this picture in the 21st century. And probably most of you will instinctively know who that is supposed to be, because there is the icon of the Ripper today. Top hat, cape, fog, gaslight, you know, there's a knife there in case you didn't get it first time. This wasn't the reality at all, but this is what we look, this is the bogeyman, isn't it, really? Our fear of the dark, essentially. And uh, this is what you see in the movies, he's been reinterpreted in movies, fiction, pop songs, video games, comic books, toys, cartoons, science fiction, everything, you know? This is the myth and the legend, and legends do have a habit of outliving us all, don't they? You know, The real man, I think we can confidently say, passed away probably more than a century ago, so no problems there. I think you've got more to worry about now with killer clowns, because so, they're real, <laughs> believe you me. God. But uh, the only place this guy's going to do any harm is in your nightmares, isn't it? And on this little Halloween night, as you lay your heads to rest this evening, please don't have any nightmares on my account. I'm sure you'll be all right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. 